Good morning, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. So if there is any outside, we can uh, allow them to come in, settle down and get started. And would like to first welcome you to day two of our third annual forum. We do and sincerely hope that you had a very fruitful, productive day one. It was on our side. We were very happy on the progression in terms of the issues, both in the day, but we can also recognize how this is building up over time, over the years, uh, and very clearly satisfying that we're making progress in what we discuss, and even also equally important, how we discuss them. So thank you very much, and we hope that uh, day two will be just as fulfilling, uh, and indeed uh, the, the last day to, tomorrow. Uh, but on the annual forum side, as you'd see in the program, this is uh, the last day of the two days. So towards the end of the day, as you'd see in the program, we will also be wrapping up on the substantive discussions that has emerged over the two days. Now, before we start this session, uh, and, and I say a little bit about it, uh, I have two announcements to make. Uh, one announcement uh, which is being made in this session because of the general interest, but is about one of the action groups. As you are all aware, we have three action groups which are actually essentially part of the instruments that the, the, the platform is using in terms of uh, delivering on its uh, purpose. So there is the knowledge action group, there is the enabling environment and investment action groups. Uh, now, uh, one feature of these action groups is that they are members driven, they are about members action, and they are about connecting across several members' action so that you have a greater good that is more than the sum of the parts. Uh, and today I want to just make this announcement on behalf of the Knowledge Action Group, uh, uh, because the whole process of managing these groups is actually done by the members. And the Knowledge Action Group, in fact, initially was convened, and they are convened by two institutions at any one time uh, with very specific individual focal points. Initially, the Knowledge Action Group was convened by FAO and CCAFs, uh, and that process is also such that it can rotate. Uh, you can allow new members to actually come in and take up that responsibility to convene. So um, first it was CCAFs that left and the uh, CIRAD took over. Uh, and later, FAO also moved on, uh, and AgriMEP uh, in the Columbia University took over. So the announcement I'm making is that we are at a time where CIRAD has also to move on. They have done their term, and therefore the Knowledge Action Group will be looking for uh, interested organizations and individuals that can participate not just as members of the action group, but also as convener for that group. So if you are interested or would like to find out more, please feel free to interact with the, uh, Emanuela sitting there. So I, I'm sure they know Emanuela over there, who is uh, in, in uh, CIRAD. Uh, but also AgriMap, actually, uh, Cynthia is not here, but uh, uh, Caroline is here, isn't it? Yeah, she, she is around, so pro, she will definitely be in the, in the meeting at some stage. So you can engage with those people for further information. Okay, that was about the, the Knowledge Action Group. My second announcement is, uh, is that uh, a good number of participants in the uh, GATSA actually did attend the Global Science Conference on Climate Smart Agriculture in Johannesburg last week. 
Now, this is not an accident because, in fact, organically, there has been some relationship, some engagement, some link between GAXA and the Global Science Conference for on Climate Smart Agriculture. And therefore, one thing that actually emerged again in the progression of that organic relationship is actually that the, the fourth Global Science Conference on Climate Smart Agriculture was much clearer, much specific in terms of uh, the collaboration between the, that process of the science conference uh, and GATSA. And this was in the context that uh, the conference was focusing on implementation and how to catalyze, how to engage and support implementation. And what was emerging is that GATSA is obviously one of those processes and probably a key one of or at that, that can take up some of those implementation issues emerging out of the conference. And this is why today we would like to, in this conference also, then just communicate that uh, the outcome document of the fourth Global Science Conference is actually ready, is going to be posted by the end of today on this website. And I'm showing the website there also to indicate that the website already has uh, a lot of the presentations that were done, both in plenary and in the side meeting, uh, and that is massive knowledge in terms of what is going on on the various fronts uh, in terms of advancing climate smart agriculture. And the beauty of this is that it is actually knowledge from various constituencies on the whole value chain in the development of climate smart agriculture, from practitioners, policy makers, and, and scientists, all talking about, in fact, how all this comes together to foster implementation. So feel free to interact with the website. There is the presentations there. The outcome document will be shared. Uh, and finally, the point is to say that if you are getting inspired in any way in terms of taking up any of the actions, uh, then feel free to get back to us uh, in the NEPAD agents in terms of convening the fourth one. Uh, but we also are actually happy to announce that the fifth conference in a two years' time, is a two-year process, will be convened by CCAFs, uh, and they will also be willing to take up any discussions that relate to engagement on some of the outcomes. So that is the second announcement. And uh, finally, back to this session, uh, it's regional alliances that we would like to discuss. And we have been uh, clear actually about three things with regard to this session in terms of uh, why are we doing it? What is the purpose? The first thing is that uh, if we are going to be linking to implementation, then we need to strengthen, and we as GAXA, and GAXA meaning all of us, need to strengthen our vertical uh, linkages between the global agenda, global dialogue, the regional agenda, regional dialogues and the networks, and also what is happening on the ground at national and community level. And therefore, what we're talking about is a partnership between the global alliance and the regional alliances in terms of uh, engaging and building the coherence, alignment, and harmonization across that vertical stream. Uh, and, and therefore, also identifying how we are uh, leveraging on each other, supporting each other, and therefore able to move faster and quicker and more in, a, in, a, in a advancing climate smart agriculture. We also would like to use this opportunity in the discussions today uh, in terms of the conversation and the presentations to learn on what are the issues in terms of need, in terms of demand, in terms of challenges that we collectively as GAXA could be responding to, should be responding to if we want to remain relevant to the cause for uh, climate smart agriculture in the region, in the countries, and of course appreciating the diversity, the different needs and issues on that. So it's a very uh, 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 clear narrative that we'd like to advance and would encourage you to actually come out, uh, raise the issues, share as much as possible. And at this point, I want to invite my colleague, me, who is going to facilitate 
the first part of the, the uh, session uh, where we can also then hear from the, our colleagues in the regional alliances and of course interact on the basis of that. So me, please see you. Good morning, all. And before I, we really dive into this session, <clears throat> there's a second announcement that uh, we need to make, and it's also that the in Enabling Environment uh, Group uh, will have a co-convener step down because, unfortunately, Mark Mann is, is retiring and leaving us. Uh, so if there's anyone interested, you can con uh, be con in contact with him and discuss this uh, in the meeting of the Action Group tomorrow. So I'm very excited to be the moderator of this session uh, because it was uh, quite exciting as well to see at the last annual forum uh, the first meeting of regional alliances that, uh, that were out there as independent bottom-up and multi-stakeholder platforms dedicated to developing and scaling up climate action in the agriculture sectors. So we were able to facilitate and convene uh, about eight uh, regional alliances and processes in different regions last time. And based on that, uh, there was a big priority that was expressed by them as well as by uh, members of GAXA to increase our regional level engagement. So today, uh, we'll see how this collaboration can further strengthen and contribute to the strategic vision that we mentioned on the first day. And I will again, show it to you. You should be on the website and try to uh, review it and see how you can contribute to it. And we hope that these discussions today as well will be, uh, enable us to identify concrete areas where GAXA can add value to the work of the uh, regional alliances and vice versa. The, uh, this morning event will have two parts, and the first part will span uh, uh, a number of regions, and then will, uh, after the coffee break, Martin Boilia will moderate the second part that will span another, uh, another um, parts, uh, other parts of the world. Uh, so I will start with four alliances and processes, and we will right away go into the session. Uh, I will have to be strict with timekeeping, especially since we've already um, uh, started a bit uh, later. So eight minutes each, please. And uh, we will hear today in this first part from GEXA's uh, engagement uh, at the regional level over the past year, as well as four uh, alliances or processes in Southeast Asia, in Europe, in Europe and Central Asia, as well as in Central America. So without further ado, I'd like to give uh, the floor to Marwan Latki, who's expert in sustainable agriculture here uh, at the FAO, and as well facilitator of the regional engagement task team uh, of, the, uh, of GAXA. Marwan. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to make uh, this initial uh, presentation on the regional engagement of GAXA and the collaboration with the regional CSA alliances, networks, and processes. I would like to highlight a certain number of key messages before going into the activities we've been developing, because it's not only about activities, it's about a whole process with them, starting with a respectful dialogue to get them on board, since these regional CSA alliances are voluntary processes that are bottom-up, that are context-specific and region-specific, and multi-stakeholders platform with their strengths and weaknesses. They are not subsets of GAXA, this is important, but they are partners. So in that regard, there was a need to be respectful of their specificities to be inclusive of their diversity, to listen to their voice, and to be open to the dialogue, and also to understand the regional 
context. It's also something very important from farming systems, regional trends, policy agenda, uh, the ecosystem of stakeholders or the patterns of partnerships that we can observe in those regions. And to have a joint steering process for reinforcing common ownership. It was a continuous engagement. First, by uh, introducing GAXA and inviting them to the annual forum of last year and have them to speak. Have also a first technical meeting last year to meet each other, to share experiences and lessons learned and identify issues of mutual interest. To build a joint program of work for 2016-2017 but also to be supportive of each region, if, even if it's only through a light support. And what was the most important during the year was to seize opportunities for advancing these collaborations. Also expanding with two new uh, regions that are here with us today, the Pacific and uh, Europe. Um, this annual forum is an important step as well, where we dedicated more time and more visibility to these uh, regional alliances. A second technical meeting to be held tomorrow morning for reporting on progress, that's something very important, and update the work program, and developing an inclusive study toward joint project proposal for fundraising. I will let you know more about that. So today, that's a constellation of partners for GAXA in different regions, some being alliance or platforms, other networks, hubs, or other processes towards the establishment of such network or partners. Only some are GAXA members, and others so far are not. What are the lessons learned? First, it's bottom-up, rather inclusive and independent voluntary processes with specific objectives, functioning, and institutional setting in each region. They have been developed on an ad hoc basis. basis. They are diverse in terms of organizational setting and in terms of focus. Some are really focusing on climate smart agriculture, others on climate adaptation, others on climate resilience, but this is not a big deal. What is important is climate action in the agriculture sectors. They are also diverse in terms of leadership. Some are driven or sometimes led by governments or regional economic integration organizations or farmers organization or international NGOs. Some have a lot of members, others have few. Some have a coordinating coordination mandate to implement a regional policy intervention framework or a working group, and others are more project-based. They have built consensus and convergence among stakeholders by building consensus on the outcomes of CSA, on the three pillars. This is something very important, and in some way, that's also the power of climate smart agriculture. They the activities they are developing are framed by regional and national policies. And each country remains sovereign in turning CSA into practice, whatever through conservation agriculture, agroecology, precision farming, etc. And most often it's a mix of those that we are observing in the countries. <clears throat> CSA and agroecology are not necessarily competing. And in some regions, they are very complementary. That's the case, for example, in West Africa, where there is a regional CSA alliance and a regional intervention framework for CSA. But now, programs at regional and national levels on agroecology within this framework. And most of the time, at the regional level, there is no major issue in engaging the NGOs, the civil society, the farmers, or the women organization. It's important messages. At last, these alliances are embedded or aligned within regional and continental agendas and frameworks. Um, it can be <clears throat> policies, strategies, uh, ministerial conferences, working groups. 
they are also part of global agendas, COP, Sustainable Development Goals, for example. <clears throat> uh, in Southeast Asia, they have made a strong contribution to SEPSTA. In West Africa, they were part of the COP22 Agriculture Action Day. This is also something important to keep in mind. And these regional CSA alliances are facing similar issues regarding demonstrating their added value, engaging with members, coordinated large-scale group of stakeholders, strengthening intersectoral consistency, communicating effectively or mobilizing resources, but actually just like GAXA. So the joint program of work that has been developed, I will not go into the details, but basically it's based on three main type of activities to foster knowledge exchange and experience sharing. It's very important since each of them have been built on an ad hoc basis. They are very eager to learn from each other. Also to foster the dialogue and inclusiveness between the alliances uh, in participating in uh, regional events or facilitating dialogues, especially uh, between the alliances in Africa, and uh, developing joint communication activities. This engagement led to several key results. First, a joint newsletter that has been developed. And then the first ever regional event co-organized by GAXA in the Asia region involving the three action groups in its delivery. The first ever regional project proposal submitted with GAXA has partner still with, for Asia uh, for the ICI call. The first regional side events as part of the GAXA annual forum for Africa, for Asia, it's what is going to happen tomorrow. And the first ever GAXA study on and for the CSA alliances towards the development of a joint proposal for fundraising. In the different regions, GAXA participated in the annual forum of the Africa CSA Alliance and organized the regional event for Africa that is going to happen tomorrow between the African Development Bank, the African Union, NEPAD, uh, FAO and GAXA on the synergies and partnerships for implementing a large scale project program, the CSA program of the African Development Bank. For Europe and Central Asia, GAXA facilitated the dialogue between um, the uh, regional process for Eastern Europe and Central Asia and the uh, CSA hub for Europe. But they are going to talk more about that during this session. In North America, there were light facilitation between the North America CSA Alliance and the World Business Council for a regional CSA work plan. But it's mainly in Asia that the activities have been developed. GAXA supported a regional conference on food security organized by the Netherlands and Vietnam, offered brokerage between ASEAN Climate Resilience Network, uh, the regional CSA Alliance there, and the World Business Council towards the development of a CSA work plan for the regions and also a project proposal on inclusive rice landscapes. GAXA participated in the third annual meeting of the regional lines there and uh, different workshops. But most of all, GAXA was a partner of the Asia event on climate action for agriculture in Asia on strengthening the role of scientific foresights and CSA in addressing the NDC's priorities. And also, as mentioned, GAXA is engaged as implementing partner in a project proposal for the ASEAN region and tomorrow this regional event for Asia. I will end up with the last two slides. The first one on this joint project proposal, it is to provide an analytic and strategic overview of the potential and readiness for a joint collaboration between all the CSA alliances, including a project proposal for fundraising. The rationale is that we are stronger together instead of being isolated each other and that we can tailor project proposal to specific donors on specific regions. The time frame is between November and March 2018, and we hired an international consultant that you can contact if you want to provide inputs on that. So here are the questions actually that are set by this regional engagement of GAXA. 
the type of strategic role that GAXA can play, either as convener, either as catalyst, or either as communicator. But have we seen the role we have played so far is a bit a mix of all that. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Marwan. I think that uh, that was a very rich presentation, and it shows how, in just a span of 18 months, how far can collaboration and, and the willingness of, of various partners can can lead us to. And thank you as well for your good questions at the end, because what we want to do is make sure that we are proposing, we are adding value to efforts that are taking. Uh, place at the regional level and this is something that comes up in many global policy agenda scaling up and implementation and of course one way to achieve that is to engage at the regional level but the how is often um, is, is often the way uh, that we can have most impact and it's not always uh, the most obvious uh, question to answer to. So I hope that the discussion that will flow will give us some elements of answer and I was particularly, I was personally involved in, in the engagement with, uh, within the uh, uh, Southeast Asia uh, region. And I would like to invite now the next speaker, Ms. Imelda Bakudo. She's a coordinator of the ASEAN Climate Resilient Network and senior advisor and deputy head of the project at GIZ. So please, Ms. Bakudo. All right. Good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to be here with you in the great city of Rome, although in a perfect world, I would much prefer that I share with you all about the ASEAN Climate Resilience Network on the beaches of Bali or the beaches of Thailand, the riverbanks of the Mekong River. But I hope that after this presentation, I would see most of you on our shores to help us promote climate smart agriculture practices in the region. So I have very limited time and I want to share with you, I'm very honored to be the first of the alliances to share with you today. Um, Southeast Asia and climate change, I won't dwell into this because every region claims to have the most vulnerability to climate change. We share the same claims. We say that we have very long coastlines. We are very affected and it's true by, by the impacts of climate change. And the Association of Southeast Asian Nation has recognized these vulnerabilities and, and the challenges of, of climate change, but, and in doing so created several frameworks and strategies to deal with it, one of which is called the ASEAN Multisectoral Framework on Climate Change. And then there was a strategic plan, 2016 to 2025, which put two emphasis on dealing with um, climate change. And at, that was at the regional level, but at the national level, uh, several years ago, Thailand has also put forward a proposal in which we wanted to look at the vulnerabilities and best practices and in agriculture in dealing with three major crops in the region, rice, maize, and cassava, and see where the vulnerabilities lie and see where the best practices are. And so from, from a regional response, we came up also with some national responses and we had a picture of what we are dealing with in the region. And so there were priority practices that came out of this regional assessment and I don't know if you can see some of the flags, the countries were uh, prioritizing rice shrimp farming, crop insurance, implementation of climate resilient varieties of crops, um, dynamic cropping calendars. So these are some of the priority practices that the countries put forward in which they wish to collaborate with each other and learn from each other. Um, and from these exercises, there also came about a manual 
um, in which that provided the ASEAN a regional guideline in promoting these particular practices. The importance of this is that these um, publications or these guidelines got the official endorsement of 10 ministers of the 10 countries of Association of Southeast Asian Nation. So, you know, why is this important? The ASEAN is not like the European Union where there are many binding agreements. ASEAN is really more relying on voluntary agreements among countries. And so guidelines like this that were endorsed by 10 member states are quite important. And this is the context where the ASEAN Climate Resilience Network was born. This was the work of the ASEAN Climate Resilience Network with the help really of partners, especially from the Food Agriculture Office of the Regional Asia Pacific Office and a lot of our friends from CCAFs and CGIR. So then after getting this assessment, we realized who's gonna do all the work of promoting all these practices and who's gonna get the climate finance and who's gonna do the enabling framework to help us get the support for these identified practices and so the network was born in this manner in order to promote a common understanding a common approach for the 10 member countries of the association oh, as I mentioned that so the the network was um, uh, um, is, uh, the network is uh, working on several issues, one of the foremost of which is mobilizing resources. We have written several project proposals in coordination with agencies mentioned earlier. One of the latest, uh, we had a success in securing 800,000 euro from the pa BNP Paribas on climate modeling and foresight for improved climate governance, and we hope to spend this money next year with the support of CCAFs. We also work a lot of knowledge exchange and capacity building. This is a lot of regional exchanges on the topics such as agriculture, climate insurance, climate information services, and um, a lot of South-South cooperation as these pictures would show. Um, there's a bottom picture on Laos going to Thailand to learn about maize stress tolerant rice, uh, maize tolerant varieties. This is an, um, a workshop on learning all about each country's uh, programs on, in, on agriculture insurance. We have here one of the pictures on the beach. Please join us sometime later. Um, this is a very um, dynamic uh, workshop with the support of FAO and GIZ on exchanges on climate information services for agriculture where we put meteorology department and the agriculture department together to better understand each other and to learn about from the 10 countries experiences. We also, and then we don't just meet on the beach to have a great time. Most of these, um, most of these regional exchanges yielded a lot of regional policies. For example, the crop insurance workshop yielded a, a guideline that was recently endorsed by the 10 ministers of agriculture and forestry in ASEAN. And so this would provide a guideline for countries such as Myanmar and Laos, which don't have yet a scheme on agriculture insurance. And as Marwan uh, mentioned earlier, um, we were looking at uh, um, further support and policy support, and we have, for the first time, really pushed the agriculture sector as a united entity through ASEAN to engage in um, negotiations with the COP. It was a lot of the time, the first time for the agriculture sector in ASEAN to be engaged with negotiations because it's often it's usually the domain of ministries of environment. So we were very happy to make this uh, be a part of the final conclusion on COP23 and an agriculture decision, and ASEAN not being a party to COP, but made its way through G77 and China, which influenced the position. So apart from regional policies and engagement, yes, you can see pictures of us being here in several um, regional meetings. And the core of, and you might say, where are the farmers in your work? So at the core of regional alliances is, of course, national level implementation of all the regional agreements mentioned earlier on. So the ASEAN Climate Resilience Network has engaged in pilots 
at the, at the national level in Cambodia and Vietnam, for example, there's one picture that it's better to show picture. This is um, women farmers in Cambodia testing um, stress tolerant rice variety, the sticky rice variety, and this is coming from, from a regional agreement into a national level implementation. And so as we move on, there is a lot of work to be done, but I hope I would manage to share with you some of the priority practices that are in demand in the region. And we move forward to consensus, a lot of consensus building, which is a lot of work, having 10 countries come up with this. And uh, we do hope that we would uh, be able to get your support, especially in uh, developing certain proposals that would further move on the needs in the region. And we do hope to see you tomorrow at uh, our side event, uh, along with the World Business Council of Sustainable Development and FAO Regional Asia Pacific in the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Imelda. Um, I think that that was a, a, a very strong example uh, of a government-led alliance that uh, was able to have uh, achieve endorsement from 10 national governments on CSE guidelines. That's quite impressive. And I was also pleased to see how, even if it's a government-led alliance, uh, there are efforts as well to put farmers at the center and empower other stakeholders. And that's something that we've engaged a lot in, in, in our collaboration with uh, regional alliances. It's, how they contribute as well to our vision, and we have certainly prioritized uh, putting farmers at the center as well as uh, the issues of women and, and youth. So we can certainly explore further how, uh, at the regional level, we could uh, facilitate that uh, further. Um, so now we, I would give the floor to the next speaker, and we will move to Europe uh, with the Climate Kick flagship program. And Climate Kick is uh, so far the, the largest European, European regional hub on climate smart agriculture. Uh, and we will give the floor to Marc Nougier, uh, who's a French National Agro Agronomic Research Institute, INRA, community manager for the CSA Booster. And he can probably explain further what is the flagship program on climate smart agriculture. So good morning everyone. I'm uh, Marc Nougier, I work for the French uh, National Institute for Agricultural Research and I'm here to present you AgriSource, which is an open innovation platform for climate smart agriculture. This uh, work has been carried on by both the French INRA and the French CIRAD. It has also been funded by uh, the European Climate Kick. Climate Kick is the uh, largest uh, uh, public-private partnership in Europe with more than 250 members and uh, it uh, has a purpose of uh, encouraging uh, efforts for mitigation of greenhouse gases and adaptation of our societies to climate change. Within the Climate Kick is a flagship program called Climate Smart Agriculture Booster. This program focuses on the same targets for Europe and, uh, and focuses on agriculture. So that brings you to uh, two targets, mitigating greenhouse gas emissions of agriculture and adapting the consequences of global warming. Uh, as the flagship has a uh, focus on specific value chains, uh, my work, uh, our work on AgriSource has a slightly different uh, uh, objective. So let me introduce you to uh, AgriSource. It's an open innovation platform online and we have designed it to make it the most relevant as possible for all players of agricultural value chains. Those players come from different uh, perspectives and we need, uh, we heard yesterday all along the day the need for communication between those players with, uh, uh, as you can see I have uh, represented 
a few blocks and there is need for communication between those blocks and within those blocks. So we have designed AgriSource to be a crossroad of knowledge and network for all those players. And this uh, starts with you today. I have to tell you that this is the official launching day of AgriSource. And uh, uh, yeah, we count on you to be very, uh, very attentive on this. So, uh, so that we would make it as uh, pertinent as possible, we came up with one question uh, that uh, is asked by the users. And I'm asking to you right now. Who would you trust? Who would you trust to find reliable information and knowledge? Would you trust technical institutes or NGOs or maybe governments? Not everyone will answer this question in the same way. And that is the point of uh, AgriSource. We had to create two liberties, the liberties of accessing uh, transparent information and choosing where we want it from. Let me now show you what it actually looks like. It is now online and you are now on the home page. Uh, the first feature is the search engine, the most, uh, uh, the most important feature, and in, we have tried to make it as intuitive as possible. As you can see, uh, all players that are registered in our platform are geolocated, which allows us to have an actual map of the CSA network across Europe, but also beyond. And it is also designed as a social network where you can add your news and events uh, so for the whole community to see. Now, if we get in the depth of the search engine, uh, you can see that we have designed different profiles. Uh, we have player profiles, projects, innovation, and documentary resources. The search engine is able to search in all this, and you, can, you should know that all the content of the platform is community-based. So far, I've added this content, most of it, because uh, we are just launching it, but the purpose is that uh, all of it comes from the community. Now, if I show you uh, one player profile, is uh, an example of uh, what uh, you could actually do. It's a simple presentation. What do you do? How do you act on climate smart agriculture? Uh, it, there's a contact form, which is the basis of the matchmaking uh, tool of uh, AgriSource. And there's a geolocation. But one great information, one great added value of AgriSource is the relational information. On the, on the left side of the, uh, of the profile, you can see that there's information on which a uh, group of players this one belongs to and which players uh, actually gather in this profile. And we have also relation to specific innovation which are able to point out which innovation this player is working on or contributing to. And that leads us to one uh, uh, unique feature of AgriSource that is a re relational mapping. With all these relations, we are able to create uh, networks and uh, actually see who works on what and with who, who governs in which project and which innovation. And that is what we want to, uh, to, to show to the, the international community today. So, what next with this platform? As you can see, it is not even if it's uh, European built, it's not specifically dedicated to one area or institution. And that means that its condition for success is its appropriation by all of the players of uh, CSA. So uh, we now need to reach all those players and that is uh, why we do count on the GAXA community to be an effective relay of such a, an initiative. So now that uh, you have heard all this, I know that you may wonder, how can I help? Well, I have an answer for you. You can right away go on visit agrisource.org. Uh, the website is online, it is working, it's the very first version of it. 
we have made it as uh, flexible as possible so that we can make further developments. So now you are invited to explore it, handle it, subscribe, and put your input and uh, connect to each other through the platform. And I would say maybe the most important thing is that uh, after, after bringing your input is to make us your feedback. As I said, it is open to further development and uh, we intend to, uh, to bring some. For example, it's so far as I have been the one putting uh, most input and as I'm located in Montpellier in the south of France, you may notice that the information is uh, very focused on the wine industry and uh, the south of France, maybe uh, Europe, but it needs more and it can have more. So uh, I invite you to use this uh, platform to foster innovation, to identify projects or potential partners on multiple scales, so from local to regional and national. This is an opportunity for enabling environment for CSA. It's a tool for enhancing capacity building. And uh, you, are, uh, you have the capacity of making it actually work. So thank you for your attention and uh, make us your feedback. Grazie mille. Thank you, Mark, for a very, uh, very interesting uh, presentation about, I think, some issues that are quite core as well uh, to GAXA in terms of fostering, uh, one of which is a uh, public-private partnership. So, you know, you are, I think, a good incubator of, and in, in more than incubator of, of one of the largest public partner, uh, private partnership in Europe. And today we didn't, he we didn't have a chance to hear of some of the examples, but yesterday I know that Pan Pan in the Investment Action Group uh, gave some of, of those examples. As well, the fact that you're looking, you're very much focused at looking at the food value chain, and that's something that uh, has come up increasingly in terms of the necessity to have a systemic approach, especially uh, if we want to have climate smart agriculture being sustainable and it's not enough to just look at practices. And as well, your open innovation platform. Uh, innovation is very core as well as how to, if you want to scale up that, you have to bring players together and it's not easy. This collaboration and we, we've been talking about how to break down silos and how to bring and connect people and it's hard to, to, uh, to do it in the most effective way and as, as well to, 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 to give value to that in terms of result. So congratulations for that initiative. Uh, you all heard about how you can give feedback and if there's still time, a suggestion we can make is that uh, you can also use the speakers, the CC speakers corner downstairs to give a further presentation on that. Uh, we would also encourage you as an aside comment that any, you know, as discussions were, were really rich yesterday and today as well, we don't have always uh, the, the, the time to take all your views. So if you have uh, suggestions that GAXA uh, could address in terms in our work through the D3 action groups or also regional engagement task team, please take a piece of paper that you have in the little wooden box, boxes on the table and just drop it in, there's a box there that is multicolored uh, on the first row in the left and it's going to be there all day so you can keep uh, putting suggestions. We started having a very good ones yesterday on the investment action group. So now without further ado, uh, I will, uh, we will move to Eastern Europe and Central Asia and I will give the floor to Ruben Sessa who's climate change and energy coordinator at FAO Regional Office for Europe and Central Asia and has been very active in uh, process at the regional level there on climate smart agriculture. Okay, um, let me just start showing you an overview of um, the Europe and Central e uh, region and FAO. As you can see, it's like very broad. And um, so that is why we've actually split the region up into like a different sections. So we have Central Asia, which is uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, 
Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan. Then we have the Caucasus, which is Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. And then we have uh, Belarus, Ukraine, and Moldova. And then we have the Western Balkans, which is Serbia, Montenegro, Albania, and so forth. So each of these sub-regions has a, a different, um, let's say, priorities based on the, the CSA. So, like, um, I've been in the region now two and a half years. When I first arrived in the region, there wasn't that much knowledge on climate smart agriculture. So the first process that we actually did was organize um, regional CSA workshops, bringing in like the different experts and so forth that were dealing with those priority areas of climate change for each of those regions. And um, the people that came to this workshop were not, not only government, but we also in, included all our main partners, the international, regional, and national ones, the NGOs, farmers, and so forth. So we made sure that uh, in every country, all the stakeholders were aware of the CSA, its methodologies, and like uh, the different pros and cons and so forth. Um, also something that we did was um, like training with our country offices and our sub-regional office so that they had a clear understanding of what CSA is. As, as we're all well aware, CSA is used quite freely as terminology and I have to say that most of the time I don't actually think it's a CSA approach. So um, we try to work very strongly with the country offices so that when they're using the terminology they're actually doing the, term, the, the CSA approach as well. So um, the process, I think, was quite successful. Um, like on the screen, you see the, what we call uh, the country programming framework of FAO. So this is like uh, happens every two or three years. And it's actually what the government tells FAO they want to have main support for. So before, um, let's say, the, the, the period that I arrived, most of the country, uh, the CPFs, didn't actually include CSA. In fact, they maybe mention mitigation, adaptation, but not like integrated approaches. Now, as you can see, all the new CPFs that are coming out now actually has specific requests from the government asking the FAO to support them in climate smart agriculture responses. So this is actually very useful for us because not only ensures that you have the ownership of the country and the government, but it also allows us to use internal funds like CPFs and so forth, which can be up to half a million. So this allows us also to use technical and financial internal uh, funds. So um, when we're developing uh, CSA approaches, there is a number of issues that we're also looking at in parallel. We're looking at major, um, let's say, strategies and recommendations within, inside like um, the country, including the NAPs. But in particular, we're also looking at if there's major other commitments that the government has made, for example, underneath the Paris Agreement, but also under other conventions and so forth. We also have... Um, uh, let's say strong linkages with the donors we have in the rail region so that we try and link up any CSA interventions with our let's say donor, donor base. Uh, now as the SDGs have been introduced like we're asking all our country offices to work very closely with the government on the SDGs, the targets and the indicators and ensuring that any new projects and proposals that are developed actually show how much we're improving some of those baselines and SDGs. And then finally, there's, there's a number of other issues that we've also been looking at. For example, as already mentioned before, agroecology is being um, promoted quite a lot by FAO. There is some synergies, but also di major differences between CSA and agroecology, but we're actually seeing some of the components which we think could be interesting to put into a CSA approach. So, for example, the social components underneath for agroecology are quite strong, they're quite interesting. So we're seeing if those elements can also be put in our methodology of when we're actually developing a CSA. In particular, like the rail region also has a lot of natural hazards. We've, in the past, had uh, different communities working on DRR and uh, climate change adaptation. And we're actually trying to make sure in our CSA approaches that DRR is fully integrated into the, the CSA approach. So like actually bringing those two different communities together. And uh, another issue in the region, there's uh, quite a lot of issues on nutrition, like uh, let's say um, bad nutrition and also like access to food and so forth and uh, we're ensuring there's like um, nutrition indicators and uh, assessments when we actually develop the CSA approach as well. 
Mm. So I'm quickly going to go through some of the um, the, the sub-regions. So uh, as we can see in Central, Central Asia, we have um, major issues on productivity and income, climate change, DRR, and energy. And you'll see that energy also in our region plays a major role on like um, the climate change debate, in particular on the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, just a couple of examples, like at the regional level we have a, a calcium 2 GEF project, it's uh, 15 million from GEF and um, about 50 million in co-financing from the different partners. This major looks like developing uh, climate resilient uh, systems and drought resilient systems. Uh, mainly water management, but also has a policy and legislation component. And then at the national level, we've been uh, uh, using the calcium 2 as an umbrella to actually access additional funds. For, so, for example, in Kyrgyzstan, we're now developing like a CSA project for 40 million with a green climate fund. In the Caucasus, one of the major issues that has been... Um, that we've identified is like a deforestation due to energy needs and also um, agriculture and livestock production. And uh, here we've been developing several projects. For example, in Georgia, we've already managed to access about 10 million from the EU to develop a CSA approach and developing the actual practices and so forth to allow farmers to transition. But this is going to be hopefully supplemented with a green climate fund of 15 million plus co-financing to also deal with the forestry. So in, in general, like um, forests have been degraded due to like energy needs, so like um, fuel wood, and also like uh, the um, unsustainable livestock production systems. So here underneath the Green Climate Fund, um, EFAD is providing loans to the governments of around 10 million, and uh, we're actually discussing with uh, EFAD as having them as a partner on the Green Climate Fund to have the co-financing and so forth. Uh, Western Balkans. Western Balkans is an interesting region. It's like um, had quite a lot of visibility for the floods that they've had in the past, which has caused major damages. But actually, they have uh, alternating years of flood versus drought. The droughts actually cause more damage and losses in um, the agricultural sector than the floods. But the floods are actually what, the ones that actually receive the funding from the EU because it's higher public visibility. Anyway, at the regional level, the EU provided substantial funds to FAO for like, um, dealing uh, with the aftermath of floods. This was very um, successful. And um, now we've negotiated with EU to uh, get around uh, 8 million euros to actually build CSA resilient uh, systems, which also reduce the flood and um, drought in the region. So. The, this is done in a, a two-tier approach. One is like, that's, uh, the landscape ecosystem approach, and um, this looks uh, very much like what the UK government's been doing of actually getting farmers to actually introduce these, um, let's say, ecosystem-based interventions in the landscape, so they're no longer actually receiving funds for, um, for like uh, agriculture incentives for production, but actually for including these ecosystems. Um, just quickly, like um, we're also developing like all the actual CSA like interventions which the farmers can make. This is actually done with the farmers, and the farmers are testing the different interventions. And then from this long list, we should have a, a short list of like recommendations. Uh, one, of the other, one of the major things that also we're doing in the region is like we ensure that the um, the knowledge base is incorporated into um, country like let's say capacity building and educational systems. This is both formal and non-formal. So uh, we're working through um, in the formal with the um, secondary schools, in particular the uh, agricultural secondary schools and uh, universities. In the non-formal we're going through like uh, extension services, farm to farmer field schools and so forth. Um, last example is Macedonia. This is quite an interesting country because we're actually providing, like uh, FAO is providing substantial support in a number of areas. So first it's the actual like um, assessments. We have a, a number of like uh, GIS and methodological systems. So this is the National Agricultural Zones. And uh, we're now working with Google and creating this Google engine which allows you to um, work from the cloud on satellite imagery which is less than 10 meters with uh, Sentinel-2. We're looking at uh, Macedonia's leg policy and legislation to see how we can improve the enabling environment for farmers. 
We're developing both uh, landscape and agricultural interventions. And again, as I mentioned, like, um, so I have to stop, so I'm going to go straight to the last slide. <laughs> so uh, next steps. Um, uh, there's, uh, the major next steps is that um, un, in rail, we're developing a new region initiative, which is um, the management of natural resources under climate change. And th this will allow us to further develop uh, our work on CSA, but also um, different components. So we're, we're looking at flagship countries to get additional support. Uh, we're continuing to do the linkages with uh, the EU-based donors, but also the climate financing donors. And uh, the next step is definitely uh, improving the li linkages with the existing networks that we already have in the region and ensuring that they can actually provide services related to this CSA work, but also creating the linkages with um, other networks as well. So we actually um, now are signing a letter of agreement with Climate Kick and the CSA Booster to actually create the, the stronger linkages between Europe, Central Asia, and the Western Balkans. But also, like, uh, we see that there's uh, a good potential for actually working with the GACs and the action groups in specific countries. So we, we don't look at building a big network. We actually work more on developing these small action networks for each sub-region or country where we have specific needs and requests. We then reach out to the community, and they actually then provide the services. So that's how we try and minimize workload and admin and, and so forth. So that's it from my side. Thank you very much, Ruben. And I think it was another example of the diversity of regional alliances or processes that we have around the world. I mean, this one was very much multi-stakeholder from the beginning. Um, and as well, you can see how it's very context-specific and you did analysis of sub-regions. And as well, very good point about um, the awareness and capacity building around what is the climate smart agriculture and the value added of, of that approach in terms of integrated uh, approach uh, to the pillar. Uh, you also, I think, highlighted the, the, some of the work that you do that, that relate to, uh, I guess, trends or, or priorities that GAXA would like to be involved in, in in terms of fostering landscape approaches, for example, and social integration of social components. Uh, so that was uh, very interesting. And thank you as well for bringing again how you are engaging youth and as well farmers systematically, more systematically into your work. That, that's, I think, a very inspiring example of, of what could be replicated elsewhere. Um, and thank you as well for some of your suggestions for next steps, uh, including uh, with strengthening uh, some engagement with GAXA. And we're happy as well that you are uh, exploring further collaboration with Climate Kick. So now, um, uh, last but not least at all, and a very active member of GAXA in Costa Rica, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Roberto Azofefa, Chief of Sustainable Production Department at the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock of Costa Rica, who can talk us about the continuous uh, efforts in the region in Central America to uh, move forward on climate smart agriculture. Uh, good morning. Yeah, thanks to the, the organizer for uh, this opportunity to be part in this uh, wonderful experience. Um, the Central uh, American Integration System is the, the group of seven countries in Central America and uh, Dominican Republic. One of the high uh, level of governance is the Central American Agricultural Council. CAC, uh, formed by the ministries of uh, agriculture. And in, in the process for the regional strategy on climate smart agriculture, the Central American Agricultural Council uh, has been supported by several uh, international and regional partners organizations. Uh, the elaboration of the regional strategy 
on climate smart agriculture in Central America has been a participatory process based on the uh, Central American Agricultural Council agreement announced in uh, COP21 by the Minister of Agriculture uh, from Costa Rica uh, to boost a climate adapted sustainable agriculture in the region. It's the same uh, climate smart agriculture for us uh, as a route to advance together uh, in the long-term process for food security uh, of the countries, adaptation and mitigation in the agricultural sector. And the main challenges are related with the efficiency and sustainability uh, to enhance conditions for higher uh, productivity, articulate efforts among public and private sector to generate enable, uh, enable environment for rural entrepreneurship and innovation, uh, develop inclusive system uh, of knowledge and uh, information with participation of farmers' organizations, strengthen food security and nutrition, develop sustainable food systems, incorporate biodiversity use and conservation as part of the development strategy uh, at farm and community level, resilience and adaptation, improvement at farm community level, enhance local agri-chains, technology and investment for added value and reduce food loss in agricultural sector. The regional strategy uh, has four axes. Uh, number one is uh, efficiency in uh, production systems and sustainable livelihoods. It includes several uh, action lines on knowledge management, capacity building, uh, research and technology transfer, innovation for sustainable and inclusive agricultural production. Number two is integral risk management and uh, climate change adaptation with action uh, lines on integral risk management, adaptation, conservation, and sustainable use of uh, uh, agrobiodiversity. And number three is uh, sustainable and low emission uh, agriculture including action lines in low carbon agriculture, uh, uh, watershed management, clean energies in agricultural system, the use of organic residues uh, for energy. Number four is uh, enable framework action, action lines about integration of climate smart agriculture perspective in planning and monitoring, financial mechanisms, promotion of risk transfer, gender equity and youth inclusion. Uh, the process to, to foster climate smart agriculture in the region is uh, an ongoing, um, but there is a need to enhance coordination and, and the regional strategy uh, is the frame of, of work to coordinate the, the several ongoing initiatives in the region. The leadership and governance uh, of the strategy is in charge of the Central American Agricultural Council, uh, the high political level, the executive secretariat, secretariat of uh, Central American Agricultural Council, the coordination level, the technical regional committee is, is the core group uh, in terms of uh, monitoring and evaluation, and the technical regional working groups um, on climate change and risk management, research, technology transfer and innovation, uh, family farming, food security and nutrition, rural development, uh, competitiveness, commerce and agribusiness, and agricultural sanitation and food inoculness. This is my uh, presentation to share with you. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, Roberto, and uh, congratulations for the successful adoption of this regional strategy. It's quite impressive to see uh, how comprehensive it is, and you've incorporated you know, the, the participatory process to bring uh, an inclusive approach, as well as um, agri-food chain and the whole food systems approach, biodiversity, and as well in your enabling framework, how to include gender equity and, 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 and youth inclusion. And I, th I think you mentioned as well the monitoring results, which is also interesting because it, it, it could also inform a bit our process on CSA metrics and how uh, at the regional level, level it's done. So um, you will have had a first set of examples of how at the regional level uh, there's very active efforts to try to scale up climate smart agriculture. We don't seem to necessarily find the same um, perhaps sometimes uh, unhelpful uh, controversies that we find at the global level that were not necessarily uh, grounded in reality and we can see that uh, in many ways there are many things at the regional level that can be uh, advanced quite uh, forcefully. Uh, so I'd like to uh, open the floor now to questions from the audience. I think that what we'll do is that we'll take a set uh, of questions, a first round, if you could introduce yourself before you ask the questions. We have about, I know that uh, we started a bit late, so but I would say that we have about 10 to 15 minutes uh, for discussions. So, someone, yes, please, in the back. Please introduce yourself. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm Domenico Vito from Politecnico di Milano. Two questions, one about the platform presented by Climate Kick. Um, how do you mean how do you manage the different, uh, you, you show the net about uh, the interaction. There is like an, I don't know, a system to manage this interaction between the users and um, uh, um, uh, briefly how, the, how it uh, works. And another question about the last presentation, um, in order to um, address the participatory process, how the participatory, participatory process are addressed in order to gather all the information from the user in, like in a unique pl um, platform or program. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Thank you very much. I'm um, from the East Africa community. Uh, j just to, move, to get the experience from, I think, Imerda on the Imerda, yeah? In the Asian experience on the improvement of the of the national insurance programs, uh, how the community involvement, because this has been the challenge on how the community can be ready to benefit from the insurance schemes in terms of securing their crops. Thank you. Thank you. I see three hands now, and after that we'll, we'll uh, close the first round of sessions. So, Jan Helsen. Yeah, a question uh, for Ruben. I had uh, a year in Tajikistan from 2014 to uh, 2015, so uh, working for a Swiss development project, uh, DRR, Integrated Watershed Management. So is the, the CSA approach now, is this integrated in, in this DRR uh, watershed management? Are we talking the same thing? Or is it, is it something that is localized within the, within the watershed? Uh... Yes, I will give the floor to you and then Lena. Yeah. Thank you. I would like to start by thanking the presenters. But uh, my, qu I mean, an appeal that I'm going to make uh, with regards to the presentation made by Mark and Emelda. I don't know whether it is possible to cascade the same, I mean, uh, interventions, maybe in Africa. Because as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I mean, I'm really touched because these are, the, you know, an eye-opener and we really need similar interventions, maybe in Africa, if we can just maybe say, do some testing, uh, pilot projects or pilot interventions. I think really it can actually uh, get, get somewhere. And uh, then lastly, uh, I don't know from uh, the organizers whether it's possible, because since yesterday I learned something. Uh, for Africa, really, I think some of the presentations, I don't know whether if you are able to really, or going to maybe say create, create a platform where we are going to have uh, some exchange programs. 
um, farmers and civil society organizations from Africa, they learn from their counterparts what they are doing so that we can see where we can even um, converge. Thank you. Thank you. And actually, I think that I will keep your question for the, the second uh, part of this event, because the, after the coffee break, it's going to be uh, the three African alliances, as well as uh, in the, the Pacific, and I think there's another region, and North America. Yes. So um, I will now give the floor to the two ladies, if you could introduce yourself, please. Thank you, Juliana, for on the Inter-American Development Bank. I have a question here for Ruben. Uh, if he could elaborate more on the incentives that uh, he mentioned to reduce deforestation. And the second question, in terms of metrics to track results and impact, this, uh, what are the metrics that uh, FAO is using to track impacts? And for Margaret as well, on the metrics impact. Thank you. Good morning, this is Leida Mercado. I am from the Tropical Agriculture Research and Education Center from, uh, from Central America. My question is for Mark Wan. Um, you, you talk about some regional proposals to fund some of the activities that AXA is developing at the regional level. Um, I, I wonder if you can elaborate a little more, and also you said that it's an opportunity to prepare proposals between November and March 2018. Uh, because I think it would be a wonderful opportunity based on, on what we we have in Central America with this regional strategy that we need to go and operationalize that with a working program. And, and one of the components is knowledge sharing. It would be wonderful to have some kind of um, support on, on that area. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So uh, um, I have about seven questions. Maybe the first one uh, was, was uh, directed to Marc on Climate Kick. If you could answer that, please. Uh, yes, so I had two questions. The first one is uh, about the net of interactions. Actually, this net is also community built. Uh, it's uh, when you register, you can uh, pre uh, make a precision of who do you work with. For example, I work in a, um, in a research unit in Montpellier. In this research unit, uh, three big organizations uh, are, bring, are brought together. Uh, the CIRAD, INRA, and uh, Montpellier Supagro. When I create uh, the profile for the, uh, the unit, I, uh, I put uh, two com uh, three components that are INRA, Supagro, and, uh, and, and uh, CIRAD. And this creates a bond between the profiles. These are the bonds that are specified uh, in the platform and that we can actually map uh, after it's uh, uh, registered. I hope that was clear. And now the second question was uh, for uh, an equivalent intervention in Africa. Uh, I would be glad to, <laughs> but uh, we are only uh, uh, three of us working on this, so uh, uh, it's uh, still in development, but uh, we can uh, arrange some uh, training and uh, yeah, uh, make this work. Uh, Africa is, uh, should also benefit uh, from uh, this work as well as any other continent. Thank you, Mark. I think the, the, the best way will just go through the, so maybe Ruben, you can uh, answer the questions that were addressed to you. Thank you. Okay, uh, the first question was like the integration of um, DRR with uh, CSA and CSA, uh, CSA and CCA. Um, and yes, more or less, it's th that's the approach we're doing. Like, for example, um, government, but also like um, international agencies like GIZ and UNDP have already done a lot of work on the DRR approach. And we're working with them now to see if we're going to work in the same uh, area, if then we uh, assess like how can you also look at the watershed management and other issues like this, so you have one comprehensive uh, approach. So that, that's been um, uh, what we've been doing, in, uh, in particular in Kyrgyzstan. And um, now in, in new region, in new like uh, national regions where no one's worked, we actually is from the start working together so that we have a, a common common approach. Uh, the second question was like on, on incentives um, for like uh, the rural community. Like mainly it's been actually um, choices of increasing the choices of the, the families. Like most are using like firewood and so forth because it's the only 
it's the only or the cheapest option. Um, so the, the project brings in a private sector to actually increase the number of options they can use, but also like increase the efficiency. So for example, we're also working with like a, a partnership fund, which is a government institution to create the value chains for more, more energy efficient stoves, which actually reduces consumption anyway by 25%. And then like there's other options which actually um, diverts fuel wood to actually other energy uses. Uh, the, um, the, ma the matrix for evaluation, well, for the forestry one, it's mainly um, developing this forestry inventory and a monitoring system. As I mentioned in one of the slides, we have this uh, Google engine platform that we're developing with a uh, high resolution satellite imagery. So you can actually go in quite rapidly because the satellite imagery is like passing over every six days, I think. And you can actually very quickly see if uh, deforestation has stopped, if uh, there's reforestation occurring, the, the, the rate of reforestation and so forth. I and mean, that's just one example. There's also other monitoring components, but just to give you an idea of some of the components. Thank you. Roberto, did you have a, a question? Post okay, you can maybe during the coffee break. Ah. Sir, could you please repeat your question regarding to the participatory process in Central America? Okay, uh, my question was about uh, how the participatory process was managed in order to gather all the information in a unique uh, methods. So, how the like the participatory process has uh, been yeah. managed? Yeah. Well, uh, we we have the the, the support uh, from CICAPSIAT and. Uh, uh, we had the support from a consultant, international consultant. So the, the, the tax for the international consultant uh, was to, 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 to get uh, all the information in a, in a paper. Uh, I have uh, some, some sample here in order to share with, uh, with people here. It's a brief uh, uh, regarding to the process in Central America, but uh, it just uh, uh, by the, the service of international consultant in, in Central America. Thank you. Imelda? Okay, I understand the question to be um, an interest on sharing more on the agriculture insurance schemes in Southeast Asia. Is that correct? Yeah, okay. So um, on, at the regional scale, um, there are varying experiences as, as we learned from the um, exchange event that the ASEAN CRN has supported. Um, but uh, in general, through several prioritization workshops with governments and various stakeholders, the implementation of agriculture insurance seems to be seen as a risk transfer mechanism and really as a need coming out from the region. Um, and it is seen as um, removing the burdens pure of, of climate change impacts solely on the farmers. So different levels and different models. There are some in which um, it's subsidized scheme by the government, a previous um, agriculture subsidy scheme is transformed into an agri ag agriculture insurance scheme. There are some in which it's a PPP scheme in which the initial investments are often uh, shouldered by the government such as production of baseline data, and then an ins a private insurance company or a reinsurer comes in, such as Allianz or Swiss Re within the region. And, and uh, there are what, what, what is encouraging is that there are best case scenarios in the region, like the Philippines has had a very long standing experience of having agro crops insurance. And, and Myanmar, for example, and Laos has indicated that they wanted to learn from the Philippine experience. So this is one of the benefits of having our exchange learning events. And then I projected uh, a guideline or a manual for measuring farmer demand and establishing a pilot scheme. It might be useful. You can see it from WW. ASEANCRN.org, and it was endorsed by 10 ministers of agriculture and forestry in the 10 member states of ASEAN, and it might be useful also to other parts of the world. 
and you can download this um, guideline from the website. <coughs> Thank you. And Marwan, I think there was a, a question as well for you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, so, indeed, here is the, the, the process we have in mind for developing such project proposal or proposals. The first thing we noticed is that there is a set of CSA Alliance friendly donors. For example, GIZ invested in the regional CSA process or Alliance in West Africa, in Africa, in Southeast Asia with the three million dollar project uh, and probably in other regions. Same for example for Norway. They are investing in GAXA, they are having regional projects with FAO for All Africa, they are also uh, investing in the Eastern Africa Farmers Federation sharing the East Africa CSA platform. And we want to offer to these donors uh, articulated and coordinated way to act at scale. This is one important point. Um, but there's also a sociology of donors. Uh, for example, so far Germany is not member of GAXA, more observers, but at the same time investing through GIZ a lot in CSA and these alliances. The second uh, important aspect is South-South cooperation. Imelda mentioned about uh, Cambodia who wants to learn from the Philippines. This is at the regional level and at the global level, even yesterday we had discussions on that for West Africa who wants to learn from Southeast Asia on resource mobilization or many regions who wants to learn from each other on many topics. And this South-South cooperation can be on insurance, insurance schemes, can be uh, on rice, for example. It's key for many regions in Africa as it is key for Asia. It can be on landscape. China is doing great in terms of landscape uh, restoration. Uh, it can be on value chain, it can be on irrigation. Uh, Morocco has a great expertise uh, in irrigation and is funding a trust fund to share this expertise between regions. Uh, it can be on climate services. It's a fertile topic. So the point is to have a multi-layer approach um, and it's to be donor oriented and to size opportunities. We need for some proposals, of course, from the regions, like for Central America, suggestions of cooperations. And on the other side, we are processing reverse engineering to know what donors want and to have this matchmaking happening. So we cannot say so far what it will be about but for sure your suggestions are most welcome and also the dialogue with donors and some are in this room will be very important in that regard. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I'm afraid that uh, we are ending, we, we are actually running out of time for more questions and uh, we don't want to stand in the way either of the coffee break but the coffee break will offer more opportunities to engage but I think Marwan summed up a few of the uh, key messages that, that I get as well is that there are some uh, interest as well to exchange and co-learn uh, within a region and among regions and GAXA could uh, provide some, some uh, contribution in, in that sphere. So you, your thoughts are welcome. You can uh, drop some suggestions in the box or engage during the coffee break. So a big clap, uh, please, for our panelists and congratulations for all your achievements. And now coffee is awaiting for you on the ground floor. Uh, we will reconvene if possible, uh, given that we're running a bit late in 20 minutes. Thank you.
Okay, thank you so much. We are continuing with the same session from this morning. We will get a series of presentations uh, and uh, then get some discussions. And the discussions we're going to have can actually also raise or include issues that have been uh, uh, raised in the morning part of the session. Uh, I think and many of us would acknowledge that the sharing from the region is very rich uh, and informing a lot on uh, what is going on but also how things are being done in different parts of the world in terms of responding and advancing the whole evolution of climate smart agriculture. So I will not labor anymore on that aspect except now just to go straight and invite our first speaker. We have five speakers uh, and uh, I'm sure somebody will help to manage the time. Yeah, Frederica? The time, yeah? Okay. So we will start with the first presentation which is the Africa CSA Alliance running support for implementation of agriculture NDCs in Africa, and this is the work that is being coordinated by the Nepal Agents and African Union in a pursuing, in fact, very closely related to the decision of the Heads of State Summit. So, uh, Mr. Abiyabo. Um, thank you very much, uh, Martin, and good morning, everyone. So my, my presentation is basically around the Africa CSA Alliance and what the Alliance is doing in support of scaling up climate smart agriculture in Africa. Uh, the context we, uh, within which the Alliance sees CSA in Africa uh, is from six areas. One, uh, the global commitments in terms of the sustainable development goals, uh, the Paris Agreement and its nationally determined contributions. Um, at the continental level, we're also looking at the African Union's Ag Agenda 2053, which is a 50-year de development vision of the continent. Uh, we're also looking at uh, CADEP, which is the African Union's Comprehensive Africa Agricultural Development Program, uh, and its vision 25 by 25 uh, on CSA. Uh, the vision 25 by 25 is a vision uh, endorsed by the African Union Assembly to have 25 million farming households practicing climate smart agriculture by the year 2025. Uh, within this, we also have the national agricultural investment plans uh, that countries uh, have developed. And then uh, we also have the national and regional climate smart agricultural programs and projects. And putting all this together, uh, we have the regional and national alliances that are supporting the implementation of all these goals and visions. Um, there is a high-level political commitment at the African level, and this is contained in what is referred to as the Malabo Declaration on Accelerated Agricultural Growth and Transformation. Um, in fact, uh, the Malabo Declaration's Goal 6 specifically mentions uh, resilience of livelihoods and production systems to climate variability. And within this commitment, uh, we have the uh, Vision 25 by 25, uh, which also called for the creation of a climate smart agriculture platform on the continent. And this came into being in 2015 with the first meeting of the Africa CSA Alliance. The second meeting of the Alliance also uh, took place in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, we are expecting to have the third meeting um, before June 2018. Implementing Climate Smart Agriculture and its um, vision 25 by 25 is hinged on a number of uh, pillars. One of the major pillars is on country and regional actions. So at the country levels, uh, we supporting countries in doing analysis, uh, mobilization of partners and resources, and learning and as well as skills development within the agricultural uh, sector. 
uh, the whole issue of financing is also uh, very, very important. And then, obviously, uh, the importance of research and innovations within the agricultural sector is key. Um, there are a number of implementation support initiatives that are uh, being done to support uh, the country and regional actions, and this include uh, the NEPAD INGO Alliance, which is also referred to as the Alliance for CSA in Africa. This is an alliance uh, between NEPAD, five international NGOs, and four technical partners in the implementation of CSA in Africa. So um, for us at the Africa CSA Alliance, what are our key focus areas? Um, our key focus areas are basically in three areas. Uh, we're looking at supporting the implementation of the agricultural components of the nationally determined contributions. And we're also <clears throat> looking at supporting countries uh, to access climate financing, both at the international level and also advocate for increased public uh, finance support uh, for the agricultural sector. And what we are doing in terms of the alliance support to the African NDC, uh, agricultural NDC implementation is to support the development of coherent policy frameworks, uh, support the d capacity development for implementation and action uh, in the agricultural sector, and this is through engaging governments, um, making a very strong case for agriculture uh, within the NDCs. And in 2018, we're supporting the training uh, of, on the agricultural components of the NDCs in eight African countries, and this is going to bring together policymakers, uh, key uh, decision makers, as well as civil society and other uh, players in terms of uh, agricultural uh, implementation of the agricultural components of the NDCs. And as we, the second aspect also is looking at supporting countries to assess climate financing for agriculture. And if you do an analysis of how much money goes to the agricultural sector from the climate finance, very little of it. In fact, uh, just about three billion <clears throat> for uh, agriculture which represents 11% of all adaptation flows, uh, goes to the agricultural sector. And uh, there was a recent report by the International Institute of Environment and Development, which indicates that uh, less than 10% of actual uh, financing, climate financing, goes to uh, local actors, which means that there is a very big gap that needs to be filled in terms of making sure that the money that is uh, intended for uh, farmers or local people uh, reaches them. Um, the third leg of the Africa CSA Alliance has to do with the platform meetings that uh, we, we, we've been having. Um, the main aim for having these coordination platforms is to ensure coordination and also to be reporting and getting more information from all the regional alliances, from all the national alliances, from all key stakeholders uh, to deliberate on what are the emerging issues, what are the challenges, what are the opportunities for implementing uh, CSA in Africa. And then also uh, it provides us uh, a forum to share knowledge and have some uh, expert information as well as on the ground implementation um, success stories so that we can have uh, peer learning and exchange uh, of ideas. The third um, and one of the most important has to be with communication and advocacy. Uh, for us to be able to win over uh, public sector, public sector um, and policy makers, we need to communicate the story. We need to communicate the success stories. What are those things that we are doing right? What are the challenges? All these things need to be communicated. And the outcome of these uh, forum meetings are communicated to the highest level at the African Union Assembly where key uh, decisions are made. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Kwame. That was the first presentation on the Africa Alliance. Uh, and in fact, we follow up with uh, uh, two more uh, presentations that are within the African context, but more, in this case, we can use the term sub-regional level. Uh, and you can actually also appreciate some of the connections uh, between what Kwame presented and what is uh, following. So the next presentation is a scaling up of 
scaling up the adoption of CSA in Eastern Africa, opportunities and, and challenges. And this is coming uh, through or from Stephen Michuri, uh, who is actually a, a very a seasoned player in terms of advancement of who, not just climate smart agriculture, but agriculture in general in the continent. He's the CEO of Eastern African Farmers Federation uh, and also chair of the Eastern Africa CSA platform. Thank you, Stephen. Yes, good morning. Uh, so I'll be presenting about uh, East Africa. And uh, that's the outline of my uh, presentation. I think it's pretty uh, straightforward. Um, so what's the outlook of uh, climate smart agriculture in Eastern Africa? Uh, I think what is very uh, key, uh, and I think we all know in this uh, hall, is that uh, we need to transform agriculture significantly in order to meet uh, uh, related challenges of food and nutrition. We know that uh, we have climate smart practices that exist, but they need to be uh, inventorized and they need to be scaled up and out. Uh, we know that uh, we need considerable investment in terms of uh, filling the knowledge gaps, research, and other things. Uh, we also know that uh, we have a capacity challenge uh, across, across the board. Uh, so we need to improve and disseminate um, climate smart information, uh, and especially to the large number of farmers. Some of the initiatives uh, that are already present in the sub-region uh, include uh, the tripartite program uh, in, in East and Southern Africa, COMESA, East Africa Community, and the SADIC uh, program, which is already developed. Uh, I think we just um, heard about the Africa Climate Smart Agriculture Alliance that has been formed. You know, FAO has been working on uh, mitigation of climate change in agriculture, and the program has been established. Uh, we have the East Africa CSA platform that was formed uh, in 2015. Uh, and the program is now developed, and uh, the intention is to support member states, development partners, policy makers, people in extension, smallholder producers to integrate uh, climate smart agriculture adoption. And uh, there are various programs uh, that are supported by uh, uh, FAO uh, in Kenya, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Somalia, Uganda, through the FAO sub regional office. Uh, for us, at the Eastern Africa Farmers Federation, we, we have developed, uh, uh, we had a program at Iwarani with support from NORAD, uh, where we developed um, a standard CSA package that focused on uh, soil and water conservation, water harvesting, agroforestry. Um, uh, farm planning and enterprise uh, uh, selection, uh, energy saving, biogas, nutri nutrition management, agronomic practices. We did this in about four countries in Eastern Africa, and I think there are pictures uh, of that particular process. And you looked at various uh, commodity value chains uh, for that particular purpose. We've also uh, tried to look at uh, integrating uh, mobile uh, technology using innovations. We have a platform we call the eGranary, which, uh, which is intentionally made to assist farmers in terms of decision making. And what it's done is that uh, it helps us uh, develop innovative partnerships with markets in terms of market access. We provide crop insurance, we provide um, microcredit, uh, and uh, the farmers access certified seed, including daughter and varieties, and are able to access uh, certified fertilizer. And so far, we have 4,000 farmers already in this. Uh, we have given out more than $200,000 worth of loans and even received compensation as a result of drought. So this helps in terms of aggregating farmers virtually, but also trying to mitigate uh, some of the risk factors that they actually face uh, in their day-to-day -day, uh, farming activity. So some of the opportunities that are available, um, I think I've talked about some of them already. We need to scale them up. Uh, in terms of policy, I know we've worked a lot uh, on the COP, in the COP meetings, we were part of the process that uh, supported the substar process uh, with respect to the text on agriculture. But still a lot needs to be done at the sub-regional level and at the national level because there seems to be a disconnect uh, uh, from the global level and how that you know, trickles down to the national in terms of uh, policies. Coherence in research, there's, there's so many people doing a lot of research 
but uh, there's ch there are challenges in terms of some levels of convergence. Uh, you know, how, do, how does everybody then converge uh, around some of the good work that they're actually doing? Coherence in investments, I think we are, we, are, we are losing out in terms of investments by both domestic and international private sector. Uh, again, uh, islands of investments everywhere. We have a very young population. I think this has been mentioned. How do we actually uh, uh, motivate uh, this strong human capital base? Uh, I think the underlying factor is that uh, we all acknowledge uh, the effect of climate change. So some of the challenges um, definitely is the fragmentation of land, fragmentation of farmers, over cultivation, few scalable and successful investment models, uh, recurrent and unpredictable drought. I think that is now with us. Uh, in as much as many of us know about CSA, there's still so much limited knowledge, especially to the farmers and, the, and its benefits. And my last slide is on the next steps. We need to ensure that uh, we not only have the right policies, but we have proper strategies, we have the structures in terms of governance, uh, we have implementation arrangements in place. So it's not, not just having policies, but the whole uh, process of um, implementation. Uh, we, need, uh, the height, we need to heighten efforts in terms of mobilizing technical, financial, and investment support. I think the last presenter talked about uh, there's, so, there's so much money uh, available for climate change, but very little when it goes to agriculture, and especially to the farmers. You know, how do you ensure that uh, uh, there's equity in terms of uh, mobilization of these investments? Of course, the issue of awareness, communication, and strengthening cap capacity of stakeholders, right from our education system to the farmers, all the way to where we are uh, today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen. Uh, we just follow the same process. I will not elaborate or summarize at this point. Uh, but let me proceed to invite uh, uh, Migo from ECOWAS, West Africa, and is making a presentation on the CSA initiatives in West Africa uh, and the operationalization of the West African CSA Alliance. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, ECOWAS want to, to thank FAO and all the partners for the invitation to this uh, second uh, forum of uh, GASCA. So our presentation will uh, concern West African initiative and operationalization of the West African Climate Smart Agricultural Alliances. Uh, before I uh, go uh, far, uh, I want to remember you uh, the ECOWAS policy. We have two policies and one program led by agency. The, po the first policy is the agricultural policy that is uh, uh, on the way of uh, NEPAD uh, uh, agency policy for uh, the continent Africa. And in ECOWAS, we adopted it in uh, 2005. And now we are updating this policy uh, to take account several ways of uh, climate change, gender, nutrition, and other thematics. And uh, the second policy concerns environmental policy of ECOWAS that is adopted since 2008. And this policy concerns the civil regional action program for vulnerability reduction to climate change, ECOWAS meteorological program, and convergence plan for the management and sustainable use of forest ecosystem. And we have uh, a program, a program led by agency uh, that is created by ECOWAS and uh, based in uh, Cavedo. And this agency concerns the renewable energy and energy efficiency, efficiency ECRE. What are the challenges in West African region? Uh, the challenges are the first is to promote resilience and adaptation to climate change, integrating climate change concern into global and sectoral development policy, the strategy and all the program and project. And the second is to contribute to the reduction of the gas emission uh, uh, that is promoted in the NDC adopted by all the 15 countries and submit to COP21 in France. And the third challenge is, is to strengthen intersectoral coherence and coordination of policy 
program and intervention for young regional ownership of the climate smart agricultural concept to contribute to fund climate smart agricultural into the regional agricultural uh, uh, policy that is regional uh, uh, investment plan and into the 15 countries national investment plan too and to establish synergy and complementarity of all the intervention in all the ECOWAS region in West Africa and to capitalize the practice of climate change agriculture in the region and to promote the scaling up. Uh, to, uh, for this, uh, all the policy and program how to do, in ECOWAS region, we adopted our Climate Smart Agricultural Alliances by organizing a high-level meeting with the Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Agriculture, and all the donors or partners that are presented here. And during this meeting uh, uh, in, 20, uh, in 2015 in uh, Bamako, we adopt our Climate Smart Agriculture Alliance and we, uh, we adopt to uh, how to implement it with all the donors and all the partners in the region. Uh, after the adoption of, of our alliances, what are the major initiatives underway? What is an, uh, ongoing now to implement or to operationalize these alliances? Uh, I will show you here five initiatives that are ongoing for this way. The first initiative is concerned agroecological transition in West African support project. Uh, this is a project which uh, now is signed and will begin since January uh, uh, 2018. And is, uh, the donor is the uh, French Development Agency for 8 million euros. And this uh, project will concern uh, how to support the agroecological transition in West Africa and promote energy adoption diffusion of ecological intensification farming practice. The second initiative is Sustainable Agricultural Intensification in West Africa. This is a support program too. Uh, it is an ongoing uh, instruction project with European Union uh, to promote intensification uh, of best practice of climate mass agricultural. Uh, the amount is uh, uh, 8.2 million euro uh, and uh, we are now uh, 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 writing the project and all uh, the, the partners are agree with the European Union for the financing. The third is promoting climate smart agriculture in West Africa program. This is a project we submit to adaptation fund for a regional project and uh, the concept not is okay and now we will submit in uh, January 2018 the full proposal for uh, 14 million dollars and uh, it is uh, on the way, it is, uh, uh, I think it is okay for this project to upscale the climate smart agricultural practice in all, in 15 countries, in four, in five countries in ECOWAS. And the, uh, the last initiative is Entra and CP, Global Climate Smart, uh, Climate Change Alliances, just say plus. This is for 12 million euro, and it is okay now, and uh, we sign the contract before the end of December, and it is to help the countries uh, for NDC implementing and uh, to strengthen the capacity of ECOWAS to coordinate and monitor with all the states of the region uh, uh, in the implementation of the party agreement. And we have now for writing a big program, regional program for restoration of degraded agricultural land in West Africa. Uh, it is a big program for all the 15 countries and the donors who can help us is Spain uh, Agency for, for International and Development Program, ICIT and FAO. Next step, plan and collaboration opportunity with GACSA and West African Alliance. We have uh, uh, four ways. First is capacity building of stakeholders to support the implementing of the intervention framework established in Bamako in 2015. The second way is to support for initiatives deployed by the regional stakeholders in the context of the new cycle of uh, the National Investment Program of Agriculture. And the third way is to mobilize all the partners, all the new partners, to support these initiatives. And the last is to strengthen 
link with African and global alliances for capacity building and knowledge sharing activities. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We seem to be keeping to time, which is very good, and uh, hopefully we'll get uh, the bonus of more time to discuss. So I'm going to invite the fourth presenter, and uh, this is uh, now uh, crossing the oceans. It's on uh, soil health, a climate smart agriculture building block in uh, North America. And uh, Fred is going to do that for us. Fred is, a, is not just an expert, he's also a practitioner as a farmer and is chair of the North American CSA Alliance. Fred, go ahead. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and, and speak with you today. Um, I've only got one slide, and that's the slide that's up there now. So I'm not going to uh, be going through a lot of this stuff because I just wanted to explain uh, this is sort of our roadmap uh, for North American Climate Smart Agriculture Alliance. And, but I really think that GAXA and, and all of the, uh, the regional uh, CSA uh, providers, I think it was brilliant to come up with the three pillar uh, scenario because I think the, they just basically uh, represent how do you get to where we need to go. And one thing that, that NAXA uh, has really, really focused on is farmer leadership. And by the way, I am a farmer. I uh, just finished my harvest last week had one of the most challenging uh, harvests we've ever had, challenging spring as well. Um, we shouldn't have had a good harvest, yet we had, in the States, we had, uh, I think, the second largest uh, corn harvest that we've ever had. So um, one of the things that, uh, the, one of the reasons why we're, we're focusing on farmers is, is you take, we can all come up with the very best plan that we think is going to make climate smart agriculture work. But I'll guarantee you, if the farmers don't buy into it and implement it, it's dead. It will not work. So we feel like it's more important to, to get farmers involved and get them understanding the, you know, the importance of this and get them to, uh, to go out and, and sell other farmers. Sort of train the trainer we, we heard yesterday is a, is a very, very good idea. So um, one of the things that, uh, just to explain this, this the, the first, the middle line there is the the uh, partners that come in and, and contribute to the to the overall basis. That's uh, we got all the farmer groups, like the farm bureaus and the, and the commodity groups, as well as we got farm equipment manufacturers, fertilizer seed companies, uh, other NGOs, uh, environmental groups, um, and we all get a chance to work together, and that's really important. Um, that we we understand each other and we can learn from each other. That's where all of the uh, the knowledge sharing comes as well. But one of the things we're really focusing on, and one of the things that really make farmers stand up and notice, is is economics. And you know, if it doesn't make economic sense, then they're not going to probably do it. So we far, we focus on the economics. Every farmer is is, is interested in in higher productivity and profitability. So that's the first pillar that gets them in. And even in the states, we have an issue with getting some farmers to even believe that, that, cl that climate change is, is real. If you get to talking to them and ask them how their weather patterns have changed, oh, yes, they've changed tremendously and we need to do some things. So you, you sort of backdoor it and come in from the back door. And then first thing you know, that um, they're, they're understanding and, and they're actually um, uh, adapting before they even realize they're adapting to climate change because that's what they've done. Um, NAXA welcomes all production systems, whether they're small or they're large. Uh, every single farm can benefit from soil health, and that's one of the reasons that we really, really concentrate on soil health. Um, we have in, in North America the, uh, an, an institute called the Soil Health Institute. It was created to, to work on some of these things, and we also have uh, a, a, a partnership with with them, uh, with others, and, and we actually have a bunch of farmers that are participating in, in demonstration farms clear across the Midwest. It's called the Soil Health Partnership, and, the, and most of these partners, which are a member of NAXA, they recently uh, have acquired another $20 million for, for research to find out some of uh, the resilient uh, practices that, that might really work. Uh, 
Why soil health? Well, because right now we have low prices in the United States. We have an abundance. We have a little bit a different uh, challenge than maybe some other places in the world. We produce too much. But again, uh, the way we survive is you have to keep your costs down and you got to make sure that you have an, uh, a very less environmental impact. So that's why we talk about soil health, because when you have additional soil health, you have extra bulk density in your soil and you have nutrient retain retainment. One of the things that we really push in the states now is, uh, is uh, cover crops. And because the cover crops, when you plant uh, after a regular crop, that it scavenges a lot of the nutrients and it keeps them there. So it doesn't go into the water system and we have some algae bloom challenges in, in some places of the country and, and we need to make sure, and, and Canada as well as uh, just, it's, there's environmental as well as uh, economical impact if you uh, let those nutrients go. So that's why it's so important to do that. Farmers are all about managing risk and soil health is one of the things that really helps manage the risk. We have crop insurance, uh, but we have had some challenges with that, with integrating crop insurance with, or I mean, uh, cover crops with that. So we've got that straightened out. So it's very important to have nutrient retention and what you do when you have higher uh, uh, crop, uh, uh, higher um, ability to hold water, as well as you have the ability to take a drought that, uh, you know, because cover crops as well as no-till and, and conservation till, uh, they work in dry, we dry weather as well as, as wet weather as well. Um, we have several lo local landscape projects because one of the things that we've all been guilty of in the past is finding a one-size-fits-all. That usually happens with the federal government, but uh, every, every landscape is different. So how do we find ways that work on one landscape and not the other? But the last line is where I really feel on the, on the chart here is where we can really benefit uh, GAXA. We can, we can learn and, and come up with uh, what's working in North America, but then we can share those ideas with the rest of the world, and then we can also be here and learn from, from all the other regions as well. So knowledge sharing is going to be a big part of our success, and I really think that that's what we need to do. Uh, COP23 finally has recognized agriculture as a very meaningful and uh, important part of, of, of climate change, and we have a lot of solutions. Our, our main uh, work of our 501c3 is called Solutions from the Land, and that means that we can be the, the solution for these problems rather than always the culprit of the problems. So we, we really do think it's important that we uh, include farmers and make sure that they're involved and they carry the water and have the farmers go out and, and get other farmers because this whole thing is based on trust. If you don't trust the process, then you're not going to be successful. And we think that uh, the, but, but having a farmer-led organization as well as uh, uh, integrate this in, in the countryside is going to be successful. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Fred. We're going to get the last presentation, which is a uh, 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 Jean is going to do that for us. It's uh, on enhancing partnerships for CSA in the Pacific. Jean, it's all yours. Thank you. Morning, everybody. So the Pacific uh, region is probably the new kit uh, uh, this in the GAXA space. We don't have an alliance as yet, but uh, that's why I thought of giving you a little bit of an overview of who we are, what we do, and how we want to position ourselves better. This for climate smart agriculture. So established about 70, 70 years ago, it's one of the nine member agencies of the crop of the Council of Regional Organizations of the Pacific, the crop agencies. It's a principal scientific and technical organization that supports development and it has three goals, economic development, resilient communities and uh, communities that live long and healthy lives. The Land Resources Division, is, uh, I'm the director for the Land Resources Division, is one of the, the bigger divisions. It has about uh, a bit less than 100 people. 
Uh, it's one of ten divisions uh, and or programs. Our vision is to contribute to a resilient, a food and nutritional secure Pacific community with well-managed natural resources and thriving markets. And the mission is to provide effective and innovative expert advice and coordinate services for sustainable food and nutritional security and to enhance adaptation to climate change and build resilient communities. So since my arrival in 2000, January 2018, we have tried to, or we are in the process of reorganizing ourselves a little bit with uh, the aim of coordinating better the services and also to position ourselves better for uh, providing services to our member countries. So the overall objective, uh, food and nutrition security and uh, resilient communities, and we have actually a system of pillars, with each pillar headed by a pillar head, this one on genetic resources, conservation and use, second pillar on sustainable forest and land management, for at plus food security, the third pillar on integrated climate smart uh, agriculture for small island development states, and the last pillar on uh, value chains and markets for livelihoods. Uh, this is, uh, this each pillar has a number of projects and, has, and actually it is part of a matrix system that, uh, this, that uh, projects cut across uh, these different pillars. Advisory services at the moment are uh, provided in climate smart, climate smart Agriculture, R4D, Plant Health and the issue of biosecurity and animal health and production. And our role as, uh, at the divisional level is to better coordinate, to make sure that things are better uh, prepared ex ante and better implemented, uh, just that we have robust impact pathways and that we have also a robust no knowledge uh, and communication uh, and information system. So a few examples. Seed for conservation and use. I've mentioned yesterday we have the CEPACT, Center for Pacific Crops and Trees. It's uh, globally recognized uh, for its collection, in vitro collection of aroid, uh, edible aroids, uh, especially, especially the taros. And, but we also have these collections of yams, uh, sweet potatoes, bananas, and uh, uh, these uh, trees with, uh, with food security purposes, breadfruit, and we are diversifying into uh, uh, fruits and, and vegetables. CEPACT had an audit uh, a few months ago, this led by the Crop Trust. Uh, and uh, we came to, well, to, 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 to the, the co conclusion that uh, as far as quality management systems are concerned, we could improve ourselves. And this is what we are trying to do now, get the things right. Just making sure that all the SOP standard operations protocols are uh, respected. Uh, we also want to uh, focus from uh, not only on conservation. Some people call our CEPAC the museum. Uh, and, and I've been kind of a conservator, just taking along uh, dignitaries from the Pacific region in, just showing them the, 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 this what we have in the center. But this, we want to reach out, making sure that, uh, that people have better access to uh, the right planting material. Second is sustainable forest and land management. Uh, this, some of the, this, uh, we get support from uh, GIZ to, uh, to help us in Red Plus. Uh, there's an, in regional forest uh, there is a regional forest inventory support facility with the Asian Pacific Network for Sustainable Forest uh, Management and Rehabilitation. We are in the space of regulating better the uh, indigenous tree species and linking this to markets. And we have, within the context of responding to uh, cyclones, uh, this whole island uh, approaches with participatory land use planning and making sure this, that uh, we are not focusing on one aspect of uh, of agriculture, but it's an integrated aspect. Uh, integrated climate smart agriculture, the third one, this multi-location trials of climate smart crops, home garden models, crop livestock production systems, modeling soil fertility, uh, soil fertility for atoll food production systems, participatory breeding for improved adaptation to CSA, drought, pests and diseases, and then uh, this installing uh, and understanding better the demand pool market driven approaches to climate smart agriculture. Uh, organic farming is an important component uh, this of, of this approach. So the issues that were discussed yesterday and, and even this morning, issues of scaling up and scaling out, I think uh, everywhere in the world we are dealing with them. This, as part of a program, we have been uh, establishing policy banks. The aim is here to make sure that information, as far as policies are concerned, are more available this, by other member countries in the region. At the moment, it is only in four countries, but the intention is to scale this out. 
We also work with FAO on uh, statistics uh, for evidence-based policy analysis, thus using statistics for, better, uh, for, for a better understanding what uh, the, uh, the policy options are. We have an organic, uh, organics policy toolkit. And then we have a series of, uh, call it information and knowledge management brokers, uh, PIRAS, this is uh, very much aligned to what I heard this morning. Uh, um, I have to check uh, the agri source. Uh, there's an open source of information. This, uh, we have the BAF, P E A F P Net, uh, the Pacific Agriculture Forestry Policy Network, that in theory could be instrumental in uh, taking across and informing people about CSA. And last but not least, there's the Pacific Agricultural Information System. Okay, strategic partnerships, as I said with FAO, a few, a few months ago we had the uh, first ever ministerial meeting with FAO and this SPC, and this leads to some kind of uh, an umbrella uh, partnership. We are in the space of SPS, sanitation, phytosanitation, and hopefully there's also this, uh, the start-up of a climate smart agricultural project. We're also dealing with DFAT and ACR, this, these are Australian-based uh, uh, organizations that build for capacity within LRD, but that also this gives us, give us the research, research for development, uh, the uh, products that we can use in our development uh, space. Specialized partnerships, uh, for instance, to respond to pests and diseases, uh, to land care management and so on. Partnerships with existing communities, especially the European Union, is one of the, was one of the, the biggest uh, partners. So last uh, slide. How do we see we want to be part of this global GAXA? And we would also want to see GAXA playing this a supportive role in the, in the Pacific uh, region. And it could do this by, this, first of all, I would say, building our own understanding of what climate smart agriculture is within the context of SITS, small island development states, providing the tools to uh, SPC LRD to create ro robust uh, impact pathways. It was mentioned not only what, is, what we are doing now, but what we are anticipate changing in the future, uh, developing economies of scale, this trying to bring down the average cost and also this uh, economies of scope, not to, to spread ourselves too thinly, to come up with models that we can scale out very, this more easily. Uh, this applying more, uh, more effectively ICKM. This we have these various platforms. I'm afraid that if some projects come to an end, that also those platforms will come to an end. And then this uh, deepen our, uh, this, uh, our partnership and making it more uh, innovative. And uh, this, especially since we are very much uh, cyclone prone, maybe help us in, uh, in our response to emerging threats uh, this, uh, on, a, on a regular basis. Finaka. Thank you very much. Indeed, thank you very much to the five panelists. Uh, I would imagine you agree with me that very rich interventions, both in terms of what they are doing and also how they are doing it. Uh, I picked up a few elements that uh, seem to be running across through all the submissions, uh, including the issue of um, advocacy, awareness, the issue of knowledge and the knowledge intensive element of climate smart agriculture, uh, coming up both as the, only what is being done, but also as one area of need in, in moving forward. Uh, the issue around financing has come through and again is going beyond just more volumes but is also about access, increased access, uh, better access uh, and also appropriate allocation from the demand side of things, especially when it comes to financing adaptation uh, and productivity efforts. Uh, there has also been a number of issues raised related to policy and policy coherence. Uh, and again, looking at the whole uh, aspect of the and cross-cutting element of policy throughout the whole chain in supporting the whole evolution and application, wider application uh, of CSN. Uh, you see, 
also mentioned in several presentations how this has to relate to uh, embracing both agricultural and environment objectives. And actually, one message in there is that uh, the structures for operationalization at national or regional level are usually constructed in the form of either agriculture or environment, and therefore the challenge to inter integrate across that remains a reality. Uh, there was an interesting element raised in the North Africa CSA Alliance related to one of the services in terms of innovation forum, uh, and I think many of the presentations and discussions even yesterday is alluding to this and is something probably worth looking at. Uh, and lastly, in the Pacific, I think the issue of economics of scale is, is critical, is what we have been saying before uh, in terms of implementation, scaling up, and going to scale on what we're doing. In Africa, it's actually a common issue today that our principals are saying they are tired of nibbling on the edges. So how do we get this, and especially when we talk about climate smart agriculture, that it is the default way to actually farm, and that is not something we're doing on the periphery, uh, and ever actually being happy on the success of pilots, and you don't ever see that turning out into the way we do business. So that is an important element. At this point, let me uh, invite and allow that conversation uh, and I use that word deliberately because it's not just question and answer. It's actually less of a discussion. Uh, and feel free in terms of, uh, yes, comments and providing further input to the discussions and element rest. But of course, where you need clarification, you need more information, uh, it is also uh, accepted. So I open the floor for that discussion. Any input, comments, questions? I'm seeing some hands that are, are too familiar, but let's start, yes, with the gentleman here. Yes, um, Jan Martin Dross from Solidarity Network. Um, it was very interesting to see the ambitious targets for Africa um, regarding the 25 by 25 agenda. Um, my question is to Mr. Stefan Muchiri from uh, East Africa. Um, have these targets been translated into uh, national level targets? And if so, um, what is the strategy for the East African countries to achieve these huge numbers given the challenges that are, uh, are there in your region? Thank you. I think that's a very clear question. We'll come to that. Let's pick a number of questions, then we can uh, discuss. Uh, okay, go ahead, yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Facilitator. I think um, I'm really interested in uh, Mr. Kwame's presentation. Uh, really, really, I was really touched. And I think, uh, I don't know whether if we're going to have the presentations, that's my comment. Yes, uh, as far as I know, all the presentations will be available in various ways, including on the GAXA website. Uh, yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I thank our West Africa representative for the interesting attractions in terms of uh, funds to keep the process going. What uh, I'm not clear about is the countries involved. And uh, do you communicate to those countries you're working with? Can, can, can I get some understanding whether Ghana happens to fall in your you know, mapping? Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions, comments? Yes. I'll come back to you later. Please go ahead. 
thank you. My name is Charlie Panhuizen. I'm uh, working for the UNCCD Global Mechanism, and I have a question to Jan Helse. You mentioned that you've been establishing policy banks, uh, and I'm very interested in learning what exactly that means. Uh, is that to help countries create an enabling environment? On which topics are these? Uh, so I'd like to hear more about that. Thank you. Yes, I think an interesting question. I noticed that also issue on, on the policy banks. And it would be interesting to hear more about that. So can we take one more before we can have a conversation, uh, some responses? Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Facilitator. I, I think um, from the discussions even yesterday and today, I was also expecting to hear, I mean, issues related to traditional seed multiplications and also issues related to seed banks because what is actually currently happening in our situations is like most of our farmers, they don't have seed banks and they are relying on maybe seeds sometimes that are not even suitable in our own environment. What's the position at the present moment? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I'm going to allow the panel, the presenters, to deflect on some of the issues raised. Uh, I was also looking for the team from India, because I think they have uh, very interesting experiences on the seed issues. So when I see them, I'm going to ask them to share on that as well. So uh, to the panelists, there is the issue of Africa domestication of the continental targets, uh, issue of engaging countries uh, and how that communication is happening, the policy banks, and also the seed multiplication seed banks issue. Please take them up as you see fit. Yes, thank you. I think the first question was uh, <clears throat> directed to me. Um, I think, like I said in my presentation, the biggest challenge we have um, in the continent is actually translating uh, those continental targets to the national level. I know um, this particular process varies uh, across the countries uh, because every year there's always a uh, a meeting at the African Union where you know, countries report on, on you know, how far they have actually uh, been able to meet some of these targets. Uh, but like I said, th there's no proper, comprehensive, structured way in which uh, uh, you know, some of these uh, goals are actually translated and domesticated at the national level. So you'll find that uh, probably government may take lead in a particular process. Uh, but uh, the involvement and the engagement of the broader stakeholders then is a challenge because I think like mentioned earlier in the first presentation uh, today in this session, uh, there has been a challenge of, of funding of some of these uh, uh, initiatives and uh, most of our governments don't have you know, you know, sufficient resources to support you know, this, kind of, this kind of programs. So uh, that said, um, um, there are interesting uh, targets, uh, but there's variation in terms of uh, uh, domestication of the same at the national level. So you'll find that um, uh, during these kind of meetings, and certain countries are ahead of others in terms of uh, um, um, you know, their own national targets, but how then that builds into the continental one, then uh, you know, there, there's some, some level of disconnect. Of course, there are also challenges of, of capacity uh, across, across all the countries because you realize some of these targets, um, um, you know, uh, are put together by, you know, higher level kind of uh, consultants. Uh, and uh, the, the, the respective countries may not have the resources to be able to unpack that at the country level. So there are many disparities uh, with that respect, uh, but I think it's good to appreciate that uh, quite a number of countries are, are trying to do something around trying to achieve and report on, on those uh, kind of targets. And many non-governmental institutions are also uh, trying to uh, seek for resources, also to see how they can also contribute uh, towards achievement of 
the national targets with view of contributing to the continental targets. Yeah, I don't know whether I've answered properly. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I think it's, a, it's an important question, and uh, uh, Kwame did refer to some elements into that, and I would uh, like him to comment a bit on that, but also Abbas, uh, because the, the, the sort of overarching scenario around that is that the work that is being done by the Nepal Agency is essentially about translating these continental policy frameworks for national and regional implementation. So even when the term is not directly used, it's actually about uh, translating these targets, these policies for national implementation. When you talk about the National Agriculture Investment Plan, it is actually just that uh, act that is being done when you uh, developing those uh, instruments. So probably uh, Kwame and uh, Abbas working inside the public sector side of things. Uh, if you have any comments on that, Kwame. Um, thank you very much, Martin. Um, I'll, I'll respond to the question about how the countries or member states of the African Union are accounting for uh, their percentage of the 25 uh, million farming households uh, practicing climate smart agriculture. Um, within this context, uh, we have encouraged the formation also of country-based alliances. So for instance, uh, in Tanzania, we have the Tanzania CSA Alliance, um, where this alliance implements, monitors, and advocates for uh, CSA activities within the country. So in that space, the alliance also uh, holds government uh, responsible or accountable in terms of how much resources go into um, activities earmarked for CSA. Um, it, they also look at the National Agricultural Investment Plans, uh, how much of climate change is mainstreamed into the agricultural investment plans. So the whole issue is more about coordination, it's more about coherence in policy and coherence in policies and um, getting the results from the ground and then uh, reporting to the annual uh, forums of the um, Africa CSA Alliance. So um, I think th this is an exercise where all hands um, are on deck and a lot more uh, involvement of actors, uh, particularly those on the ground, is needed to make sure that we get the needed uh, data and information to uh, report on. And j just to make a last point on, on this, Martin, um, is to say that we are in 2018, uh, we started the processes of engaging specific countries uh, for them to report uh, in terms of the actual numbers of new farmers uh, that are practicing climate smart agriculture. And this is going to form part of the overall uh, reporting that we give to the uh, African Union uh, processes and structures. Uh, thank you. I try to show how ECOWAS members country involve uh, the question of uh, our colleague of Ghana. Ghana is a mem uh, ECOWAS members country. And, uh, if you are comfortable in French, you can use French. Uh, no, I, can't try. <laughs> I know you are trying to <laughs> practice the English. <laughs> no, I can try in English. Yes. Okay, thank you. Very okay. In ECOWAS, all the funds were mobilizing is for the 15 countries. If we mobilize found, use it to increase the capacity of all the 15 countries, for example, for uh, project engineering to uh, submit to a donor, for example, to help for the review of uh, the new generation of uh, national investment plan that are now uh, you are on the uh, ending of uh, all the formulating of the new plan. And uh, uh, we use the fund to support the NDC of all the 15 countries. For example, now the project we are mobilizing with uh, RCP 
uh, global uh, climate uh, fund is for all the 15 countries and will help them to have found to, uh, to formulate a project for uh, donors, for example. And uh, uh, we have several projects we are mobilizing now for upscaling of best practice of climate smart agriculture. For example, with uh, uh, Adaptation Fund or with uh, uh, French Agency for, of Development, IFD, the fund is to fund a project in all the countries on climate smart agricultural practice. We, for example, in our regional uh, uh, agency, we launch call for proposal of project for best practice of climate smart agriculture for all the countries. And if uh, the actors submit the project, we are able to finance, to fund the project in a local level or in a regional level for example, for two, four, or uh, other countries. And uh, uh, now, ECOWAS try with all uh, his partners, uh, his uh, uh, donors, to mobilize the maximum of funds to opera operationalize our West African Alliance uh, climate, uh, uh, climate uh, uh, practice. And uh, I, I am here with our technical advisor, if you want to uh, tell something. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Is there nothing? No? Okay. Okay, that's fine. The, we can proceed. There was a question on the, on the policy banks. Yes. Yeah, the, the idea emanated from a, a European Union funded intra ACP program. So I think the first step was to better understand uh, and to map existing policies within the Pacific region. You know, this, the geographic spread makes it very difficult for countries to know from each other what, who is doing what and uh, where do the, the priorities lie. So first we had, uh, once we had uh, a better understanding, it became a, uh, there's an online, we put it online for, 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 for member countries to, uh, to start using that information and to also share some of that information within their uh, regional proximities. Uh, so it also contributed to, uh, to regionalism. Thus we have at the moment four countries that have launched their policy banks and two of them are in Milanesia, two of them are in Polynesia. We hope to, uh, to further expand this. So it is, it's basically to, um, well, to mainstream, you know, these issues that are common and also uh, this exchange uh, data and information among the countries. Topics, uh, uh, they range from, uh, from uh, uh, this access to, to planting material, this, uh, this better adaptation to, uh, to climate change, to, uh, to drought, for instance, this uh, response mechanisms to install uh, re uh, rapid response mechanisms, and I think most important, the issue of biosecurity, because uh, all these islands have uh, trade relations, uh, this uh, difficult trade relations sometimes with, uh, with Australia, with New Zealand, uh, further afield for some commodities. So this to keep uh, the information, to keep, uh, to be abreast, to, kept, to be kept abreast, of uh, what, the, what uh, the biosecurity risks are in the region. Thank you. Another submission from the panel, issue of seed, seed but application seed banks. Maybe we come back to that. But I, I just wanted to uh, come back to the issue of the the domestication of the targets, because I'm familiar with that in the African context, uh, and actually appreciate that, uh, in fact, even before the decision of the 25 by 25 in 2014, there was quite a bit of work, and that has continued. One on the, does that 25 million exist? Can we find them? Uh, and what kind of extent of the farming systems that go with that, because ultimately you have to link to livelihoods, to, to households and, and families in that context, including incomes. But what I want to raise especially is that uh, uh, there are also and still remain some questions on uh, what actually do you measure 
uh, that you are saying at, 20, at 2025 that yes, we have 25 million practicing this thing. And that is why in the, in the Global Science Conference in, in Johannesburg last week, the issue of indicators, the issue of, um, of uh, specificity in the, those indicators and their profiles was actually very heavily raised. And it's one of the issues that we know that there are many initiatives trying to work on that. Uh, but how do we actually accelerate that and ensure that we are getting out some uh, indicators of what we mean by progress in adoption in practicing of climate smart agriculture? And of course, it's an issue that is quite and can be very local in terms of specificity. And uh, uh, the point I'm making is that it remains some area that uh, we need to concretize and actually bring up some common understanding of how we are going to measure and what we are going to measure when we say there is increase in the practicing of climate smart agriculture. So we still have a few minutes before we can break for lunch. So is there any more comments, questions from the floor? I want to get uh, new people, new comments. <laughs> It's your question on seed, is it? Yeah, so you want to answer it yourself. Go ahead. I want to really answer that question, but I'm just doing a follow-up. Right, are we saying in this room we don't have options? Because we are saying the reason why sometimes we tend to fail, if we are to say maybe we want to, I mean, in practice this climate, I mean, smart agriculture, in certain regions we are saying traditionally we do have or we had our own ways of actually producing our own seeds that can actually scale up in terms of, I mean, production in our respective areas. But now, there are certain seeds that actually we are getting, right, from even local companies that are not even doing better in our own, you know, localities. So what I'm calling for now is to say we really need to find ways of, uh, on how we can promote the traditional ways of seed multiplication because these seeds they can really do better in our own different or various environments that we actually, you know, we do business, you know, what we do our farming. Yes, I think, and it came up yesterday, both in terms of technologies, but also in some discussions, the, the, the seed element was actually emerging. And that's why I wanted the team from India, that's not here to actually share because they did share experiences around the challenge of uh, addressing seed issue in that continuum and especially when you are talking about small medium uh, units of, uh, of farming uh, entities. So yes, I think they do, the, the process does acknowledge that as an issue uh, and we need to continually look at that, how we actually respond both politically and technically because it can also impact on success or failure, especially in a sustainable way uh, over a long time. So uh, as far as I uh, hearing from the various discussions, uh, yes, we can talk about solutions, we can talk about options, but is there is a clear acknowledgement that is an issue. Yeah? I saw a hand this side yesterday. Hi, Carolyn Mutter of AGMIP. Um, so there are a lot of really critical um, immediate actions that are needed, such as improvements to seed availability, quality distribution, and things. And, um, and at the same time, plans are being put in place that are intended to be long, uh, to be resilient for a, a long period. And it seems there's quite a challenge in balancing uh, the need for em emergent um, action to improve the situation on the ground right now and, and still have that focus of the longer term resilience of these solutions. And I wonder how GAXA might be able to help with that dilemma. It's, it's very difficult sometimes to, uh, to balance the effort in each of those time frames. And, um, and I'm just interested in the panel's view on, you know, um, and perhaps how they see that from their perspectives. Indeed, I think it's an important issue because the whole issue of 
adoption and practicing climate smart agriculture is a, is a give and take. It's tra understanding and making those decisions on the trade-offs, both in time and space. So, uh, yes, I think that question is on the table. Any comments from the, floor, from the panel? Stephen, you can also uh, deal with the seed issue, yeah. So let me comment on the seed one, and then the rest will comment on your <laughs> point. Yeah, um, I, I just want to say that um, for us at the Eastern Africa Farmers Federation, one of the things that we are doing with the Africa Union, IBA, is looking at how to conserve, preserve, and promote the use of African indigenous livestock. I believe maybe you're asking the question in the same, in the same context, you know, with respect to indigenous and traditional seeds. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, uh, we are looking for also on the breeds and should be looked for in, in, in the seeds in, is in terms of inventorizing and profiling uh, some of the agronomic traits of some of these uh, seed varieties that we actually used uh, way back with the intention of uh, preserving the genetics, uh, the net genetics of it. I think uh, what we need to look at is uh, how we can combine modern science and uh, this traditional science, you know, with respect to improving uh, one, the current uh, seed varieties, but also uh, promoting uh, uh, some of the traditional varieties that actually did very well, especially in, the, in this advent of, uh, of climate change. So I think it's an area that uh, has been talked about. You know, how do we take advantage of indigenous knowledge, indigenous seed? How do we uh, build on the traditional uh, seed systems? Um, I know uh, in certain countries in East Africa, uh, with the exception of Kenya, uh, we've, we've allowed uh, quality declared seeds to be sold in, in the market, uh, which means that um, you know, farmers can actually participate uh, in, in seed markets. So I, I think it's really looking at that whole area of, uh, of the seed industry with respect uh, to you know, indigenous uh, uh, seed varieties. Thank you. And uh, input again, yes, from the panel. Go ahead. Well, just on, on, on the issue of resilience, I think we should, as GAXA, also find uh, a balance between demand, uh, demand push, you know, this, the technologies we, we talked about yesterday and the demand pull. This is what we sometimes call uh, climate uh, market-driven resilience. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, it was mentioned that if farmers uh, don't get their uh, access to markets, they will not invest in climate smart agriculture. So we have to be honest, even, uh, even on a small island, uh, and, and you deal with subsistence farmers, there is always somewhere a market, and that market has to deter, de determine uh, this the, the kind of technologies you can, uh, you can bring about and introduce. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, can we have, uh, I'll take that as the second to last, if there will be a last one. Please go ahead at the end. Thank you very much for your presentation. One consideration about the point of indigenous knowledge. Uh, I think that one of the uh, issues is to try a way to systematize indigenous knowledge in order to get it comparable to the, I don't know, modern science. So I think that the one point that is uh, uh, easily to, dis had, had to be discussed is how to systematize and digital knowledge. For example, how to translate participatory approach in uh, useful information. Okay. And, okay, this is a consideration, but also a question to the panel and uh, like a, a point of view on the topic. Thank you. That point, in fact, is is the same point being raised here on the on the issue of seed, uh, because it's not so much the seed in terms of the various aspects of it. It's about how do we recognise and preserve the indigenous part of that 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 uh, that factor in the whole agricultural system. So, any more last uh, comment input? We just on the on the. Mark to take the lunch. If there is nothing else, then let me conclude uh, by first and foremost, I think, uh, and uh, I'm sure you'd agree with me, that there will still be a lot of, uh, or there is a lot of value in sharing and hearing what is happening in other regions. Uh, it's very many times different contexts and, uh, and various drivers and enablers in there. 
but it's also clear, as we can see in this discussion, that there can be and there are lessons we can learn from what others are doing that we either inspire, motivate, or even enable us to find solutions in our own situation. Uh, I do recognize that a number of issues have been raised. Lastly, just being mentioned here, the whole issue of local technologies, local indigenous knowledge, and indigenous systems that are actually sometimes we do more harm than good to disrupt them when we, in the name of, of clean smart agriculture and other systems. So the message there for me is that uh, be mindful of how things have been done uh, indigenously and then move on to the element of balancing the act on the trade-offs. If you are going to want uh, higher productivity and all that, how do you actually balance that uh, with the uh, uh, building on uh, how things have been done in terms of indigenous practices. Uh, I've heard through and through, uh, it doesn't come very directly, but there is a mention in most of the submissions uh, that the, the reason we do what we do has to always be clear, and I'm talking about a link to people issues. There was a mention of, of SDGs and the poverty issues. Uh, or food security issues, uh, and many times that is uh, at the point where you leap in terms of having something done or something not done is how clear and concrete you are in linking to those issues that matter for people's uh, livelihoods. Uh, the issue again on the trade-offs issue of uh, balancing between sustainability, resilience, uh, and today needs is actually one element that uh, uh, probably both in our discussions, in our analysis, in our uh, interrogation of issues, we probably are saying we need to learn more on what and how we can continue to address that. Uh, and of course, is also then how do we, in the GAXA platform, become useful or be useful, continue to be useful in supporting decision-making processes that are dealing with those uh, and managing those trade-offs. And actually, you can imagine that that is at every level, from household all the way to uh, national governments and the uh, uh, policies that led to that. Uh, the issue of policy coherence continues to be a matter. Uh, and again, recognizing that, uh, in fact, climate smart agriculture whether we like it or not, is going to continue to be a, a multi-sectorial issue, uh, and that doesn't fit exactly in the way we are organized to implement things. And therefore, the best we can do is to foster those uh, cross-cutting elements across government uh, departments, interests, policies. Uh, and, and of course, uh, we are learning that that is one way we're going to make it happen uh, in moving forward. So I would like to say thank you very much to uh, everyone in, in this uh, session since in the morning. Uh, and a lot of what we have discussed is being captured. We'll continue to share around those issues, deepening them, and also finding out both how we can learn from those, but also enhance them where they are happening uh, to deliver solutions, but also to understand the problems better and more. So uh, thank you very much once again. And I would like also to thank on behalf of everybody, the panelists, and we are happy and encourage you to continue in your work. Uh, and of course, the regional alliance process will continue tomorrow in the technical meeting that Mawan mentioned. Uh, and there probably we can look at more how we can continue to engage and be valuable to each other. So, thank you very much. Um, uh, Frederica, maybe any information on the lunch? Uh, the lunch is in the same place. We're breaking at about 12.30 now. So we are coming back at 1.30. And uh, according to the program, we are going to go straight yes. into the... The three uh, So on the boards, on the, on the screens around the building, you are going to see some information on the three breakout sessions in terms of venue, et cetera, et cetera. 
but just mind and please I, I think we continue on the we've been very very disciplined in in getting back to the sessions so we're expecting that at 1.30 we will be already convening into the three breakout sessions that are going to run between 1.30 and 3.30. So enjoy your lunch. to move these pictures to take photo. What do you mean? Those camera people, are they part of, did you hire them? 